Welcome to episode 35 of Detest into the Wormhole, where we discuss everything from ancient civilization to modern day social issues and everything in between. I'm Les. And I'm Stevie J. And today we're going to be talking about the Federal Reserve and all the conspiracies that go along with it, or at least some of them, because the Federal Reserve, well, it ain't that federal and it ain't that, uh, it ain't that governmental, is it? No. When you actually look into it. So uh, yeah, we're going to have a look at these conspiracy theories. And for me, one that's really interesting is the fact that, well, just... It's not even a conspiracy. It's a fact. The Federal Reserve really has nothing to do with the government. No. No, it's completely separate. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the next question that goes along with that is, well, if it's not the government, then who runs the Federal Reserve? Uh, so the Federal Reserve, uh, from memory, has a uh, government-appointed chairman of the Federal Reserve. Yes. Who they the, the government may not even know exactly. The president does not <laughs> right, know who he's appointing. Who it is, it's just they go, a name. Uh, that guy. Um, but it's the big banks, isn't it? Yeah. It's the actual big private banks. So, yeah. Anyways, any initial thoughts before we get into the uh, the conspiracies? No, this is all just you know the Federal Reserve. We, we've had many many a discussion on this, and it's just yeah. it's mind bending and mind boggling how they have been able to have the masses believe that this is a government-run right. situation and that it's uh, for our best interest. Oh, well, of course. I mean, and we've talked about this many times, about how the government's just so looking after us and they're trying to do everything to protect us. Oh, wait a minute. No, they're no, not. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay, so the Federal Reserve, I guess, it's interesting to talk about how, uh, how it started or when it started. So 1913 was when it kicked off. Yep. And before that, my understanding of it is that the currency was actually backed by real things. So gold, silver, these type of things. Actual something you could hold in your hand. Yes. Uh, but when the Federal Reserve came in, it came to be notes, paper mm -hmm. notes. And you see uh, the, the US money, and it says Federal Reserve note on it, um, and it has ever since. But... It's actually just paper and not necessarily backed by anything. So no. uh, it's it's really, really, uh, there's so much involved in this whole Federal Reserve thing, but really they just print money, don't they? Yes. And just the fact that you, you nailed it when you said it does, like it's a piece of paper that's not backed by anything. Mm -hmm. We put so much value on a piece of paper. Yeah. You've got a stock right down there. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that one? Why can't I use that? Because... Right. <laughs> I guess if we, what if we doodle some uh, like a pyramid on it with a with and, write federal, <laughs> and we just squiggle Federal Reserve on it? Will that work? But it should because it has the mm. same amount of value. Yeah, the exact same. But we but because we've been told over and over again that this piece of paper with these lines on it and these words mm. has more importance than the piece of paper in your printer. Yeah. Well, we we are going with it. We're running with it, and we mm. and we put all our value on it yeah like when we say how like when you look at celebrities well how much are they worth right well that doesn't mean they're a good person it doesn't mean no. that they're actually um putting out anything into the world of value it right. is what their dollar amount is it doesn't yeah. mean anything well, that's a good point and you just got me thinking like imagine if we went back to say i don't know let's just go back to the middle ages somewhere yeah, right. right and we we're on the street, we're, we've got our horse and cart, and we're going to go do the shopping. And we rock up and we're like, do you know what? Here, take this for payment for this bread or for this fruit or for whatever it is we're buying. Take this paper. They'd be like, uh, bitch, please. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? What, what, what are you doing? You're giving me this nothing. Yeah. Why would I give you anything of mine? These things are of value. That thing... I don't it's even not, know what it is. It's not of value at all. Yeah, because it would have been gold coins back then. Right. Or it was chickens or it was cows yeah, or, or it was yeah, something. Yeah. Or you go and say, uh, Mr. Baker, I'll give you um, I'll give you five chickens or one chicken or whatever for the bread you're about to give me. Right. Value for value. Value for value. There's something there. There's something like actually tangibly of value. Um, but the paper note, well, what does that do? Nothing. But it goes back to some of our previous um, discussions too about, you know, these, these – um, collective agreements that we have so we've collectively all agreed as a world as a planet that these paper notes or plastic notes or whatever the currency is has value because mm -hmm. really it doesn't it doesn't 
But I was just thinking of, you know that um, in, in the book Sapiens, they were talking mm -hmm. about this country who has stone for money. Like those right. big round stone thingies, I forget. Mm. Oh my goodness, I should I should brush yeah, up I on. Yeah, I forgot them. as well. Man, but they they actually their money is stone, and who like they they just go by it, and they don't move the stone circles. They just say that's mine. So I would say that's mine, and I could move all around the country. That's still mine, even right. though I've moved away from the yeah. property. I've moved away from its location. Yeah. It's still mine, and I can use it. Mm -hmm. I can use it to barter and get things and mm -hmm. there was a story of them losing when they were moving one of these big rocks for whatever reason they were moving it and they got it's like now at the bottom of the ocean oh. and the guy still owns it <laughs> the guy still says it well it's still mine it's still here but they don't know exactly where it is right. they haven't yeah, seen yeah. it since so it's just funny how we like how in different parts of the world we do put different value yeah. on different things like it's it's just we don't learn about these things because our money is is the thing we're focused on. We don't focus on what other people yeah. barter and and trade for and and how they um, view richness, right? And value and all yeah. those things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, it's uh, it's interesting too. Uh, so going back into sapiens, actually, and and one of the things that mentioned there that I wasn't aware of was the particularly. I mean, it was all, essentially all of the empires that were. Um, you know, I guess um, taking over the world, you would say, or navigating around the world, sailing and taking over different countries, whether it was the Spanish, the Dutch, the English. But the English, seemingly, they nailed it because what they did was they got mercenaries to do uh, go and explore and to find these new countries and everything like that. It wasn't actually the navies. It wasn't the government. The, it was independent mercenary companies who were generally funded by, uh, like, stock organization so this is a time when stocks were just coming around and it was basically they decided that what they could do is if they could get a whole lot of money and people to invest if people had faith that something could be done in the future so that people put all this money towards something happening in the future so instead of getting something now mm -hmm. so like i give you the, the bread and you give me the chickens mm -hmm. um they would say, oh, I'll give you this in six months, in a year, whatever it is, I'll, I'll go and explore this country, I'll settle it for you, and uh, then we'll get this. And so there was like this, um, this whole thing of, uh, I guess, credit. That's where mm -hmm. credit came from, and it's, they started that. And then when someone would obviously fulfill the deal and get paid, then that would build trust and they would go again. But then there was people defaulting as well. Mm -hmm. So like kings and stuff would default on these loans that they'd get for wars and everything like that. So really when the, the English started to take over the world with their, uh, with their navies, which wasn't their navies, it was actually independent companies. Mm -hmm. It was actually financial institutions that were taking over then settling these places. Yes. Not the government. No. So very, and a lot of these financial institutions still around today. Yeah. So it's very, uh, it's very curious how all of this works and the fact that, uh, a lot of the um, financial institutions and families who were involved in that are also big players in uh, the Federal Reserve and the banks as well. Absolutely, so. absolutely. So you did mention uh, the year of 2000, or not 2000, 1913. Mm -hmm. But what happened in 1912? Hmm. What was that thing that happened in 1912? I don't know. It seemed like a big event. Yeah. It was like a big ship or something, yes, wasn't it? I heard, I heard I a know. story. It was, a, <laughs> it was Kate and Leo. Uh, the, <laughs> Jack, Jack. I'll never let go. Jack. I'll never let go, Jack. Get off me, Jack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Titanic sank. That's what, we, that's what we're talking about. The Titanic sank. Yep. But, well, that's when that happened. But what was curious yes. about the Titanic, and not the, just the fact that it sank, but hmm, what was curious about that? Well, J.P. Morgan was the owner of the of the Titanic with mm -hmm. another person. I forget his name, but J.P. Mm -hmm. Morgan is is the name that we're focused on right now. Yeah. So J.P. Morgan was the owner of the Titanic and also the sister ships that went along with her. Mm -hmm. And um, he was for the Federal Reserve. He was trying to. He was the the running man and the point mm -hmm. man to get the the Federal Reserve into play. So. There was a whole bunch of people opposed to the Federal Reserve. They're like, no, man, fuck you. We're fine just the way we are. Yep. Everything's running tickety-boo. We're good. And J.P. Moore is like, no, man, I got a better idea that's going to be best for me and all my buddies back here. So 
What he did was he invited all of these people who were opposed to the Federal Reserve onto the maiden voyage of the Titanic. He was yep. also supposed to be on oh, that was. ship. Mm -hmm. There was two people supposed to be on. I forget what the other guy's name was. Yep. Now, there are many different stories that I've actually read of why he didn't end up being right. on that ship. Yeah. He either got a phone call or he canceled a few days before. But apparently he was supposed to get all of these people on the ship so they could have so he could like sway them. He's yes. like, you know, like, come, like, look, look at this opulence that we could all have, mm -hmm. that we could all enjoy. Like, just look at this ship. She's gorgeous. She runs fast. She's unsinkable. All yep. of these things. But he wasn't on it. And every single per not now, I, I'm going to not say that because I'm not sure, but we all know what happened with Titanic. Yes. So the conspiracy starts there. Right. So the, the major players in the financial world, the big rich families and people with political influence in the world were on that ship. Yeah. And they were on there on purpose. Like he invited them on purpose to be on that ship under the guise of let me talk you into it. Right. Let's have a chat. Let me buy you some caviar and some champagne and, we'll, yeah. and I'll, you know, talk yeah. you into it. But uh, all the while knowing, or at least how the theory goes, all the while knowing that the Titanic was going to be sunk and um, all of those people with it. And therefore, yeah. not only those people disappearing, but the opposition to the Federal Reserve Act right. sinking with it. Well, that's just it, because even if those people did survive, because... I was reading some numbers and it said like it had only like 20 lifeboats or something like it was yeah, right. It, it was just come on. Like, I don't care mm -hmm. how confident you are. You need to make sure every single person on that ship has a way off just in case right. there is there are nothing is guaranteed in this life. Yeah. Taxes and death. That are the only thing that are guaranteed. <laughs> so. So the fact is, is that even if they survived, what's their main concern at that point? Their well-being. Right. Their families will yeah. be. It would not be opposing this thing that seeming after after an event like that, it would seem so small. Yes. So so nothing yeah. after that. And I'm assuming a lot of those people really got to thinking, like, where the hell is my life going? What am I doing with my life? What's important? And so I'm sure a lot of them just said, hey, it's not important. Yeah. Fine. Let's just do it. Yeah. Fine. Whatever. Whatever. Whatever yeah. you want. Or even as they were getting into, you know, trying to get into the lifeboats. Are you going to? Are you going to approve the the act? Are you going to approve the Federal Reserve? Oh, okay. Well, you can get on there. You yeah. can get on the boat. I mean, that's probably maybe going a little detailed. And, but you and never know. You but know. hey, you never know. You, you never, never, never know. know. But uh, yeah, very interesting that. Yeah. Very, very interesting indeed. Yeah. So the conspiracy starts there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we're going to go through a little list that we found mm -hmm. uh, for the Federal Reserve and like little conspiracies that go along the way. So the first one is the one that uh, Stephen mentioned earlier was the Federal Reserve is not part of the federal government. And uh, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. Mm -hmm. So it says, if it's not part of the Federal Reserve, why is the word federal <laughs> name in it? Like, why, why is it? And it says, conspiracy theorists will point out that you can't find Federal Reserve under government in the phone book. You have to look in the business section instead. They argue that calling it the Federal Reserve is intended to deceive people into believing that it's part of our government and is therefore democratically elected rather than it is really a sinister cabal of private bankers who wish to control world, gov world governments through controlling their money supply. The truth, is, the truth is somewhere in the middle, although the government appoints a Federal Reserve Board of Directors, again, Stevie, as Stevie mentioned, it's just some dude. The, right. the the president didn't read his resume and say you're no. the best. He was given a bunch of names or like just pick just one. Pick one man. of these. Yep. Pick one, man. We need a mm -hmm. name. And uh, who reports to Congress at least once a year? The twelve banks that make up the U.S. Federal Reserve are indeed private banks. Okay, so uh, we're going to hear this theme a lot through this uh, list that we're talking about, and it always says the truth somewhere in the middle. But really, the truth is right there in the conspiracy section of that because. Saying that it's there's a, a government appointed chairman doesn't make it a government entity whatsoever. Right. And it's got twelve private banks. So the truth really isn't somewhere in the middle. There's just a sprinkle of uh, government there, which is really the tiniest sprinkle in history. And they appoint that dude, I'm assuming, to make it look like that there that there is some gover government government right. uh, regulation 
going on. Yes, They're exactly. like, you know what, guy, you know, just we'll fly in. You show yeah. up for half an hour. You drink your coffee. Have your your little cake. And, and eat it too. Yeah, <laughs> cake and eat it too. And then off you go. I'm, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just assuming it's just for, it's a smoke and mirror show, it is. I feel. Yeah. I feel it's, it is as well. Because they just go, hmm. What's it going to sound like? It's a government. I know federal. Let's yeah. make, let's call it federal, and then because yeah. if you just called it Reserve Bank, if you just called it World Bank, mm -mm, mm. that wouldn't people would it, it just wouldn't fly. No, and you, it wouldn't have the same ring to it. You said something that, and to, to tie in with it, like if you call it the uh, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, if you just called it the Bureau of Investigation, <laughs> people were like, you go, Bitch, eh, please. what? <laughs> Get out of my house! Yeah. <laughs> Don't you bother have, trying to arrest me. You have no authority over yeah. me. But when you put federal in it, federal in mm -hmm. it, well, all of a sudden they've got some kind of credibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. We should look into them too. We should. <laughs> don't 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 listen to us, FBI. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one is the Federal Reserve has never been audited. Okay. Let's hear. The, let's hear what it says about the the middle of the truth here. All okay. right. Mm hmm. As proof that the Federal Reserve is corrupt, critics point to the fact that it has never faced a formal audit, despite overlooking an aggressive IRS that heckles and harasses and bankrupts ordinary middle-class citizens with audits. This is offered as further proof that the Federal Reserve is hiding something shady. Again, the truth is in the middle. Mm -hmm. The board of directors, here we go, do get audited, although the banks that comprise the Federal Reserve System have not been audited. So the board of directors. So that means them personally. <laughs> right, the individuals. Not, not the banks. Not the exactly. actual banks. So nobody, essentially. Right. Nobody. It's like right. it's like saying, uh, you know, I'm the CEO of, a, of a, you know, the biggest company in the world. And they go, well, we're going to audit you as an individual, but not the company. Right. So they come along and they go, all right, what have you, what have you got? Show us your finances. And you're like, yeah, okay, this is what I make. This is my income. Yeah, I spend... I spend money on all these things personally, privately. It's like a 10 minute audit, but it doesn't look at anything else to do with the corporation. Right. So it's the same thing here. So the Federal Reserve, there's no truth in the middle here again. No. It's just they've never been audited. Right. Because they're made up of 12 banks, private banks, and the, uh, the individuals have been audited, <laughs> but not the actual banks right. themselves. Right. Oh. oh my God. Wow. All right. Are you ready for number three? I'm ready. I'm strapped oh, in. Let's do this. Hang on to your hair, dude. <laughs> it charges interest on the worthless currency it prints. Oof. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the Federal Reserve does not print money. The U.S. government does through the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Again, the word Bureau. While the Federal Reserve decides how much of that money is circulated throughout the public. Conspiracy theorists allege that from 1776 to 1913, back when the U.S. government was printing its own money, the overall inflation rate was a mere 1%. In other words, a meal that cost you a dollar in 1776 will cost you only $1.01 in 1913, before passage of the Federal Reserve Act. But since that act, the same meal now costs you over $20. They argue that the Federal Reserve is the sole reason for inflation and that is a Ponzi scheme that eventually allows bankers to confiscate nearly all private property because interest payments became almost unbearable for anyone made to maintain. Amen. Mm -hmm. What is true here, let's see, is that the Federal Reserve notes, aka US dollars, are what is known as fiat currency. It is money that is issued without anything tangible backing it up. Fiat currency has collapsed every economy in which it has ever been used because it is structurally doomed to fail. Look at it this way. If you print $1,000 but expect back $1,100 through interest payments, you will never be able to get back to square one. You'll just have to keep printing money until that money is worthless. However, this problem of fiat currency, its inevitable inflation, was not caused by the Federal Reserve Act. It was caused when President Richard Nixon took the U.S. office of the gold standard in the early 1970s. Since then, U.S. dollar actually have been the equivalent of worthless paper. Right. Okay. So it was a little bit off in the beginning when I said it was right away in 1913. But 1970, gold was taken away as in backing the currency. But still, uh, the, the Federal Reserve set all of that up to, be, to, to happen and put in place the paper money that we see. And so, like, again, there it says, like, 
there's bits of truth and things like that. But actually, just saying that, it, I mean, it's it's semantics that they're trying to use there, really. Yeah. They're saying, oh, well, you know, there's some truth to the fact that the government is in control because they print the money. Well, not really. I mean, if you look at a factory, who's in control? The factory owner or the worker who sits there and stamps one piece of metal the same piece of metal all day, every day, right. or makes the same pair of shoes, or whatever the, the scenario is you want to use. Is that one individual working there in control, or is it the person who's owning and managing the entire thing? So in this case, the Federal Reserve decides how much gets printed. That is the control, mm -hmm. not the actual, oh, okay, yeah, I'll push this mm -hmm. button. Okay, great. Yeah. Because the, the Federal Reserve is actually telling the government, like the mint, yeah. how much to print. So... To say that the government's got any control is ridiculous. Right. Because they clearly don't. No. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. So, number four, is it unconstitutional? Well, I guess that's a – I mean, and this is American focus, I suppose, but yeah. this is where it's all come from. Yeah. Um, and, well, unconstitutional, we don't really have one here, at least not in the same sense as the U.S. Right. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm curious to see what it says about that. Critics of the Federal Reserve point to the fact that the U.S. Constitution solely reserves the right of issuing currency to Congress. And since they allege the Federal Reserve has now has the power to issue currency, it is unconstitutional. However, as already explained, the U.S. The US Bureau of Engraving and Printing issues the dollars and coins, while the Federal Reserve controls monetary policy by deciding how many dollars circulate through the public hands. If the Federal Reserve was actually the entity that printed the money, it would be unconstitutional. But it's not. It merely controls how much money gets released to the public. Isn't that the same goddamn thing? It's the same goddamn thing. Thank you. So the the only thing that's – it's like a loophole. They found a loophole right. and they're like, hmm, how do we make this constitutional and get away with this? Right. I know. Get somebody else to actually do the physical printing and we'll just control it. Right. Like we'll just do – every. we'll make all the decisions – and get somebody else to print it. One step, we're, right, we're one, one step, step removed. removed. Yeah. It's just a loophole, that's all. So yes, it is unconstitutional. Yeah, absolutely. And so really, you've got 12 banks in a cartel yeah. setting up the entire world, basically. Yeah. Like it's US, but world, Worldwide. financially to suit themselves. Yeah. And that's it. Mm. And they'll screw any one oh. of us, any single one of us. You don't matter. I don't matter. No, I know I don't matter. <laughs> I'm fully to them. Aware. To them. Right, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm fully aware. And it just, you know, these banks come in and they say, we'll take care of your money. Are you sure? Yeah. Because uh, there were people during the Depression who were told the same thing. Right. They were too. Remember when Greece, they had no money? Yeah. Not too long ago. Mm -hmm. They went to their banks and were like, nah, nah, nah you, you get nothing. <laughs> yeah. The money's not here, and we don't have anything to back it up with. Well, exactly. But who gets bailouts when when they when the governments do bailouts, right? Like, yeah. It's not the little guys. It's not no. the small businesses. It's the big corporations that get bailouts. Yeah. But we just, uh, you know, we just watched a um a video on this. Yes. And just recently, during the whole beer bug thing, um, there was a whole lot of businesses, small businesses, that had to close because they didn't qualify, couldn't get the the funding from the government, whatever it was. Yet massive corporations, and just as an example. One of these big corporations got the government handout of like $50 million. Yeah. And so what did they do with that? They went and bought their own shares to inflate the value of their own shares and then caught the windfall of that, made mm -hmm. themselves look fantastic and look great, um, all just based on the government handout. And then they didn't have to pay the interest on any of that mm -hmm. because it was a government handout. So mm -hmm. they, they, they're just screwing everybody at mm -hmm. every level. Mm -hmm. So if you're one of the little guys or gals like yeah. us, you've really got not much of a hope. Yeah, because they were saying there was um, um, this this ca cafe in California, in Santa Fe, California, and like people were waiting like um, with bated breath to for them to reopen, and yeah. the staff were treated really well, and everyone wanted to go back to work. They just couldn't wait, and the guy said like I don't have enough money. Yeah, and he was waiting for his um, his stipend to come in from the government, yeah. and. Because of a bank error, he didn't get it. He was right. looking at like $2 million or yeah, something yeah. of, of uh, influx to, to help him yep. get through it. And uh, there was a, a mistake at the bank, mm -hmm. mistake, and he never got it, and he never got it. Yeah, ever. 
Never got it. Never, ever, ever got it. So why is it that a, a simple bank, a simple bank error can destroy the the blood, sweat, and tears yeah. of a family and their hard earned work and their cafe and the the fact that it's a community thing that yes. everyone goes to this cafe. Like yeah. it, it's it's really an important piece of of the community, and that doesn't matter. But yeah. the big bank looking for fifty million just so they can inflate their own stocks—that's more important. Right. What's more important? Yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, and that's uh, you know, I feel like that sums up society in general and and where yeah. we're headed and where they want us to be honest, yeah. which is disconnected, not having that sense of community, and really all the focus goes onto the big corporations. So like your multi-billion-dollar corporations got multi-million-dollar bailouts, payouts, all of these things, and Really, did they do anything with it to help anyone else? No. And, I mean, it's also, uh, it's, there's so much nepotism and it's also incestuous, all these relationships that they have because politicians are, you know, paid off or they've, they've got stocks in a certain company and so it's an incentive for them to pass a bill or to pass a, a bailout or, a pay, or, you know, a payout or something like that to certain companies that they're invested in and have stocks in and all that kind of stuff. And, you know... Uh, board members are on multiple boards of multiple different companies and streams of different uh, revenue streams and everything like that, that they, they can just manipulate everything and all of this money to work for them. And who gets screwed at the end? We do because mm -hmm. of that whole inflation thing and the cost of living. I mean, it's, it's through the roof. There's no, like the difference is, and I think they use the term purchasing power. Mm -hmm. That's what they said. Like the, what we can purchase now with $1 versus what you could purchase 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago is almost nothing. But also the the wages have not gone up. No. So if the wages had gone up in uh, in align with you know what the cost of living is, it wouldn't be so much of a problem right. because you'd have enough money to cover it. Mm. But the problem is that it's gone, the gap has just gone like this. And so people are earning the same and the cost has gone right up. So now people can't afford homes. People right. can't afford to live at all. So, yeah, yeah, we're the ones who get screwed. Down the Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were saying that the, the, the minimum wage hasn't gone up. Well, at the time of that recording, hadn't gone up in like, I don't know, 12 years or something yeah. in, any, yep. in any substantial way. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. Like we're, we're working harder for the same amount of money. Mm-hmm without getting, and everything else is going up. So they're keeping you at work longer. They're keeping right. you focused on keeping that job. So you're not paying attention to the fact of, I'm still making the same amount of money, yeah. but all my bills are getting higher. Mm -hmm. Like at some point, there's that breaking point yes. and you, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing you can do. Absolutely. And you know what? They're, I mean, they're very manipulative and good at manipulating because especially through this whole pandemic thing and people will be becoming so grateful for having a job at all yes. that they downsize these companies and people end up thanking them. You know, like companies get shrunk and people lose their jobs. But if you're one of those people who kept your job, it's almost like you don't care what the conditions are or the pay is or anything. Right. You're just so grateful you've got a job. So they do all these horrible things and end up being thanked for it in a way. So it's really, really manipulative. Um, and I just think, it's tough like it's just tough to actually be trying to get by in this world these days with all these things going on because your your employer most of them don't really care either they're just wanting to make money to make yeah. profits and and that all just goes up and up and up and up the scale yeah. through government to everywhere no one cares really about each other yeah and if you do have an employer that really does care for you because they're out there we know you're out there mm -hmm. employers that really do just care about their employees and and how they're taken care of like they, they have a, a breaking point too, where they are not able to give what they want to because they're getting screwed from their top end. It's like, it's, it seems yeah. like I honestly feel, and we had this discussion yesterday mm. that if you want to be an honest person, when it comes to money, <laughs> you're fucked. <laughs> you are fucked, aren't you? Like, yeah. Yeah. You, we, we were talking about the morality of it. Weren't yeah. we? And like, if you, should we be dodgy? <laughs> <laughs> Should we try and be dodgy? Because like, when, <laughs> what's the what's the tipping point? Like, yeah. okay, because like you you know we were talking about fraud and stuff like that, and people defrauding the government and mm. corporations and stuff like that, and it's we we almost got to a point where well, is it are you only a dodgy person because they say you are because it's breaking a law that they created to keep the money for themselves? Right. Is that why what makes it dodgy or immoral? Yeah. 
Um, so where is it? Like, is it immoral? Okay, so anyone could probably agree, or any reasonable person would agree that taking grandma's purse is immoral. Like, that's something no one should do. Right. Did you do that yesterday? <laughs> I was going to say, damn, damn, it. damn it. She was asking me where it went. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, but most people could agree on that. But, but, but where does, where's that tipping point when it comes to big frauds and like banks right. and stuff? Because, like, we watched actually, um, I can't remember what it was now, but it, oh, it was, uh, I think, something on 60 Minutes or something like that where, um, this guy defrauded banks here in Australia and he did this and he fled to Greece and he had millions of dollars. Mm. And we were both kind of sitting there going, good on him. <laughs> like, the banks never gave us anything. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. they're always just screwing us over. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the banks, are, whew, you can put your money in, but geez, they don't want to give it back, do they? No, they don't. Mm-hmm. They do not. They're asking a lot of questions. What do you need this for? Mm-hmm. Bitch, it's my money. Give it to me. <laughs> give me my money. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> exactly but they have no then that's the thing i don't think they have the right to ask what is this for no, it is no, none really. of your business mm. absolutely none so they're very controlling once you give it over to to them it's no mm. longer yours yeah no longer yours you're you're accountable for like your. and here's the thing and we were talking about this yesterday because i still have to do my taxes i have to get my taxes in soon and it's like, well, you know, if, if you like up in Canada, if you owe, then, you know, you can be late without penalty, blah, blah, blah. But if if, if you don't owe, like if, if the government owes you, then you can wait a year to do your yeah, taxes. Yeah. And, you know, they're they're pretty lenient when they when you when they owe you. But if you owe them, oh, look at oh man, if you're yeah. one minute late filing, you got yeah. fees coming out. The you're evening. in trouble. Yeah. So why is that? Why? Why is my why me waiting for money is well, not important but when they're waiting for money they wanted it last year i'm just going to do some quick arithmetic in my mind here and okay the answer is they don't care whether you take money from them but by jesus they're going to take your money from you so if you owe them something it's like let's call the swat team let's call everybody yep. get the fbi the nsa the whoever mm-hmm. and get them to uh, helicopter around to your house and get your money yep. but if they owe you something it's like sit over here and see if she notices like yeah we'll, let's see if she files we'll, we'll, we'll just sit back and see if she even notices yeah you know i mean they're in no hurry they're right. in no hurry to give uh, anybody any money any free lunches you know you have to you have to you have to fight for it really. yeah and and that should be the first indication that something is is amiss mm-hmm. something is afoot when it, it's not equal footing right it, it's not equal and when you're talking about people's livelihoods it probably should be equal footing. Right. If you're saying we're taking, we care about you, mm-hmm. equal. Yep, exactly. Sorry. Should be. Yep. That's just me in my opinion, but let's move on. Number five. Ooh. It was a scheme founded by a secret group of bankers on an island off the Georgia coast in 1910. Now, there's mm-hmm. a dude who wrote a book, uh, Edward Griffin. Yeah. He wrote the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Another book we need to get. Yep. Uh, it says, which alleges that a group of incredibly wealthy bankers decided to quit fighting among themselves and instead join together to control the entire economy. As the story goes, the meeting was successful. And through their combined clout, they were able to push the Federal Reserve Act through Congress in 1913. So, and what uh, somewhere in the middle says, the meeting actually did take place, but historians are divided on the extent to which it was simply a gentleman's agreement that benefited both the bankers and the U.S. economy, or whether it was a power play to seize absolute economic control. Well, well, of course, it, well, let's let's look at what we see. Right. The world's controlled by money. It's yeah. controlled by banks, and the Federal Reserve gets to dictate uh, how much money is printed. Mm-hmm. So therefore does run the world so yes yes that happened of right. course and the meeting did take place and i love how they go well some historians say uh well let's just see what happened they had the meeting they talked about the federal reserve and oh lo and behold they're all in control of the world right these 12 12 banks so yeah i don't see where the um i could be wrong but i don't see where the kind of up in the air or the debate is about this. Yeah, I need to see more before I lean right. any more otherwise than to no, that's exactly what they did. Right. And uh um And why try and sway other people who weren't on board? 
Yeah. Why try and sway them? Because well, if it was just a gentleman's agreement, yeah. what the hell do you care what Joe down the street does with his his money and his thoughts, whatever? Wow. If it was just that, if you if you needed them mm -hmm. for something, yeah. Well, and the benefit is, you know, like if you think about um, if you think about any business, if you're in the banana business, right, and you want to make as much money as you can, and there's three other, five other, ten other banana businesses. And you say to them, but they're in different places, mm -hmm. right? And you go, well, do you know what? You guys are super cheap. We're a little bit dearer. They're in the middle. Let's make it all the same. Let's make it all one price, but let's not compete against each other. Let's just say, well, you get that area, you get that area, right. and I get that area. Then we can raise the prices and lower the prices as much as we like and dictate the entire market and how much profit we get whenever we want. Mm -hmm. So... And of course, in that case, that's bananas. But it, <laughs> that's the funny. world needs bananas. Let's not, let's not get that. Wrong. But that's but funny. when you when you <laughs> when you change that, change that when you change that over to being money, then you're controlling the flow of money around the world. And of course, like we've already said, money is power these days. And so, yeah. if you can control all of that, well, you literally do control the world. So yeah. There you go. And at the end, I'll give a little uh, Egyptian history of why we value money so much. Ooh, do, I, do we get bananas with that? No bananas. Damn. Okay. No. All right. So the next one, the Federal Reserve is a tool of the Vatican. The Vatican is the richest institution in the world. Mm -hmm. Richest country in the world. It's its own country, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. Yeah. Now this is, I mean, this country is, institution, you, same fucking thing. <laughs> But, Let's be honest. Right, but the side note to that, like, and it is a side note uh, for the Federal Reserve thing, is how does some, you know, an, an institution so charitable and all about helping, you know, the masses and poor people and everything, how can they be so damn rich while the rest of the world is in so much poverty? I know, I know. Oh, yes, uh, Miss in the back. Yep. Yeah. Because they tell their followers to give us your money because it is bad and God does not want you to have money. Oh, so it's not good for people to have possessions and money and stuff and things. No, it's sinful. It's it's sinful, right. So the only right thing to do would be to hand it all over to one single institution and organization. Right. Ah, oh, I Because then you're, you're guaranteed through the gates. Ah, oh, perfect. Are they pearly still? I don't know. I'd want those things to be, with the amount of money they got, pearly, diamond encrusted, I want bling. I want smoke machines. I want it all. I want like, spinners. I want spinners on anything yeah. round. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I want it all. For, for, the, for the amount of money they got, I want it all. Yeah. But no, sadly, they don't use it for good things. So, yeah. you know, but it ties perfectly in with the Federal Reserve. Yeah. So it says, conspiracy argues that since the early 1800s, certain radical sects of Jesuit priests worked out a deal with the Catholic Church, which may still be the single most powerful economic entity on the planet, to seize control of the world banking system in order to secure the church's economic prim primacy over the planet. Part of the scheme involved controlling the American econ economy by creating the Federal Reserve. They have nothing to say about that except that. They, they yeah. have no middleman. Yeah. They yeah. have no debunking. They're just like, yeah. this is what they say. Yeah, and yeah, that. exactly. The fact yeah. they have no rebuttal, yeah. they're like, fuck, this is it. <laughs> yeah, they're like, and, uh, you know, this one, um, the truth is somewhere <clears throat> moving right along. <laughs> it's not in the middle. It's right there. That's it's right we there. Just said it. yeah. It's right there. So interesting. Oh, my goodness. So the next one, uh, it is a tool of the Rothschild banking family. So it says this is part and parcel of the Vatican theory because those who believe the Federal Reserve is a tool of the Vatican also tend to believe that the Catholic Church is controlled by Europe's Rothschild banking family, who have been one of the wealthiest families on the planet for 200 years now. The problem with this theory is that the Rothschilds do not own any of the Federal Reserve banks. They don't need to own anything to have any kind of influence. They do, You don't need to own something. You don't need to... No. Uh, you you don't need to to have well, what, if you're the richest person right what the richest says family that their wealth is in any of those banks exactly nothing and they probably want to stay removed from it so yeah. they can't be tied to it exactly because when it all comes out when it all comes yeah. crashing down so what's they, it, like, what are they trying to say that the Rothschilds have no money well well they mustn't have any money right they don't have any money they're not part of the Federal Reserve they, they, they got money. they got nothing they've been the richest family on the planet for two hundred years 
Oh, they got nothing. Yeah. They're basically destitute. <laughs> <laughs> they leave it on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the next one. It purposely finances wars, sometimes both sides in conflict. This is your favorite one. This is your favorite one. Mm -hmm. This is what G. Edward Griffin, this is the the gentleman that wrote uh, Creature from Jekyll Island, Mm -hmm. without the existence of fiat currency, most wars of the past 200 years would have been petty skirmishes rather than full-blown bloodbaths. Mm -hmm. Without the ability of their benefactors to write blank checks most sides in any battle mm. simply don't have the money to keep fighting forever. This is so true. This aligns neatly with Rothschild banking theories, which argue that the Rothschilds have profited immensely from banking Europeans since the early 1800s. What is disturbing about this allegation is that there is evidence that bankers have indeed financed wars for centuries. Not only did they fund the Nazis, they also helped fund the Russian Revolution which was supposed to be firmly anti-capitalist and thus anti-banker. The fact that they're coming in, they're like, no, man, this is true and even worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and to make matters worse. Well, it's obvious, isn't it? One. Well, it, it's obvious as well, isn't it? That yeah. like, and, and we've talked about this with uh, with COVID and stuff like that. Like, if And with pharmaceutical companies, if your business, in that example, is right. people being sick and selling them products, then you don't want them to get better because you've got nothing to sell or no one to sell to anymore. Yeah, it's well, a bad business model. Right. Well, yeah. in the case of uh, you know banks who make money off giving loans and then trying to call back the interest. Now, there's another side point on that too, but they they only stands to reason that they would benefit from funding both sides, and they're hedging their bets really because if you just back if you're got a whole bunch of money and you say, well, right, well, I'm going to back this one side, just this one side in this uh, in this war, and they lose, you're never getting your money back. But if you back both sides, at least you're getting your money back from one and you can corrupt uh, and, and completely disrupt the other one. Now, what I say there was a side note there. A lot of the time what they want to do is not actually recover the, the funds. They don't want the physical money back. What they want these countries to do, and, and I'm talking whole countries, is to default on the loan right. so that they can take ownership of the entire country. And if you think I'm being too uh, you know, exaggerating about this, then go and look it up. I, I, we won't go into it now, but go look it up. This happens. Big banks, big financial institutions will fund entire countries for wars, for all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And when they default, and they make sure they default because it's too hard for them to make the repayments, mm-hmm. they default and they say, well, you know what? We'll forgive your loan, but you'll give us your country. Right. And so they run all massive, massive portions of the country. And so they'll start doing that and taking over and running the country, essentially. Yeah. So um, it's not always for monetary gain. It could be for physical, tangible assets. And the funny thing about that is they print this fake money. They push a button on a computer screen and say, OK, random country, there's uh, $20 billion. There you go. There's your loan. Mm-hmm. And really all it is is just zeros Numbers. on a screen. That's it. But what they get in return when the country defaults is a physical asset. They yeah. actually get a place. They get the they, tangible assets and yeah. not just that, the resources that come along with it. Right. A lot of African countries that's happened to with gold, gold-rich uh, minerals in the soil and um, diamonds, diamonds and things like yeah. that. So, you know, what they're doing is actually getting something for nothing because mm-hmm. they just go hit a button on a computer screen or on a computer, hand out this fake money that doesn't really mean mm-hmm. anything and then at the I mean, end of it, probably doesn't exist. It probably doesn't even exist, right? It doesn't even need to be printed. Right, it's just on a screen. And they know they're going to default. They know so they're going to default. So it's it's just number. It's just like well, we'll just yeah. we'll just make up a number. We'll give it to exactly. them, and then when they don't pay it back, we'll just go take their shit. Yep. And then not just take their shit, but make money off the resources in that place. Right. So it's absolute insanity. And, you know, uh, how people call, would call this, and they, they came just straight out and said that one, I, I feel, but, like, yeah. how people think that's a conspiracy theory is beyond me because no, it's, it, it's just a fact. It's, yeah. just, ha- it's just what happens. Yeah. So especially, um, not I don't want to get into it, but what's happening now in the world, mm-hmm. they're ramping up right. because the pharmaceutical people had their chance to make yeah. the money. So mm-hmm. now it's, they're like, okay, so we'll give you this chance to make your money. Yeah. And then when that dies down, we're going to, ramp up the fear even more and yeah. then you guys get to go make your money it's like yeah. it's been this plotted plan all along of, mm. of who gets 
their 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 moment to shine and who gets their moment to to collect yeah. the money. It's it's crazy. And unfortunately, it's the people who suffer. Yeah. The war machine just uh, it just keeps going. Carries on and yeah. it is the people that suffer in the end. From all of this, obviously. Yeah. From all, yeah, all of it. So the 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 next one is it purposely creates depressions in order to enrich itself. Mm. Mm-hmm. The Federal Reserve was ostensibly created to curtail the boom and bust cycle of unfettered capitalism. However, the greatest economic depression in U.S. history happened a mere 16 years after the Federal Act passed. Critics argue that this is entirely intentional. The Fed creates booms and busts because not only does it profit during boom times, it profits during the bust because it gets to seize debtors' property. And it didn't have any backup for that. It just said, yep. This, mm-hmm. this, this is it. And we can see that like yeah. they'll, especially, um, in the time before the, the, bu- the, the housing bubble burst, mm-hmm. yeah. they were giving out mortgages to dogs. <laughs> like it was ridiculous. What does dog house cost? Well, apparently a couple million. Damn. Yeah. Want to some good treats in there? Yes. Throw a dog a bone. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Like the, it was crazy that mm. people were, were just getting mortgages right. left and right. Like they yeah. weren't really doing anything because they knew they're like, well, we're not actually giving them anything. Like they right. have a place to stay for of a course. few, for a little bit, but they're not keeping it. Like, let's of be course. honest. Yeah. And when you think like that, I know you can't like, yeah. it, it's setting you well, up. It's, it's setting you up because they're, they're also, let's not forget at the top of the show, they're controlling What's coming in? Of what's course, coming out? They're controlling course. the wages. They're controlling how much is actually there. So it's it's a yeah. it's a fucking no win. It is a no win, absolutely. And we will own nothing, and we will like it. Exactly, we'll love it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely love it. I, you know what? At this point, I think I will. Well, it's too expensive to bloody own anything. And they can't. There's nothing for them to take. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> you know, when you said that, it just got me thinking. It actually is. All, and I talk about just the average person, the average human being's life and existence has been set up in a way by these people, by these banks, by these companies and big corporations to simply just be a link in the chain. And all that we do is like this, we keep this cycle going for them. So they have lots of money, right? And they will create businesses and whatever else, and corporations and, and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so really all that the money does is it cycles around and around from them back to them, and sometimes with a little more. But at the end of the day, money doesn't really exist. It's not a real thing. So all it does is it keeps them rich on paper. And what we do as the little people in between is if they were to just say, do you know what? Money doesn't mean anything, but but we want to stay rich. We want to stay at this elevated level of society. Well, the rest of us would go, well, piss off. Why would we clean your car? Why would we... Um, you know, produce things? Why would we work in a factory to make the cars that you all drive? Why would we do that? There's nothing in it for us. So they tell us there's something in it for us, which is our pay. And they go, well, you get this pay and you get to exist. You can have some of that. But what they do is really get the production out of us. They get us to make things, create things, farm things, do all of these things so that they can have stuff. And they just take the money off us again through taxes and through all of this cycle over and over and over again through you know housing and whatever it is that we buy they're making a profit off us as well so mm-hmm. we are just right in the middle and they just keep going around and around giving themselves more money more money more mm-hmm. money and all they need us for is to do stuff mm-hmm. for them mm-hmm. that's really all they need us for mm-hmm. because if 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 money just disappeared and they were not held in such high regard because of their money uh, and money wasn't the control for everything, then we would just say, well, you know what? Get some. I'll just do everything myself, yeah. for myself, and you can go over there. Mm-hmm. But that's not how it works, and so we're all trapped. Yep. And if, Yeah, and if you're not paying taxes, they're like, well, what are you doing? Yep. What's going on? And if you default on your home loan, unlike a bank where all that housing collapse stuff, if the, if the bank defaults on a loan that they took out from that bank or whatever, they all just forgive each other. Mm-hmm. And then they come for you and mm-hmm. they go, no, no, well, you've got to pay it. Well, do you know what? Get out. That's our house. Mm-hmm. We own it now. Mm-hmm. It's like, but hang on a minute. This was, what? Mm-hmm. But they'll forgive everything else. Right. It's just, uh, so set up for us to fail. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. 
So we are coming up to the end. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to close this. Oh, okay. Let me close that. And uh, so I promised you a little story at yes. the end of, of why we value and why we, because we, we, we ask a lot of why do we look up to people with, with more money right. and yeah. why do we think that we are better human beings if we, if we have money? Like why does the, the homeless man on the corner have, why is he a lesser person in a lot of people's eyes than the person in the mansion down the street? Right. Yeah. So in Egyptian times, when you pass through, like when you died and you passed over to to the other side, to get into to get into quote unquote heaven, your heart would have to be weighed against a feather. Mm -hmm. It would have to be as light as a feather. Right. So you lived with love and you lived with caring. So what they found out was that if they bought this tchotchke, this 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 thing that they could put on the side of the feather, they would buy it from the people who were weighing. So the, the judgment gods who they were weighing this heart with, they would buy with their own money this tchotchke before they died. Mm -hmm. And that would even out the, it would even out the scales. Right. So that meant I have money, I'm guaranteed a place in the good place. Uh, and that is where it started. And wow. who was the guy in Sapiens who went around to all the different countries? He went to Spain and he said, oh. I need money because I have a heart issue. Um, uh, it started with the C. Yep, yeah, it was the it was the main Spanish guy. <laughs> what was his name? Oh, oh, it wasn't Columbus. It wasn't him. Cortez. <laughs> we got it. We <laughs> found it. Was it was Cortez. So he was going right. around to all these different countries and all these different people, saying that he needed money because he said he had a heart condition. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I said that, I was like, oh shit! It's because he was. He was in the know of mm, the the heart and the and the feather and the stuff and the things, and that's why he said like he and he wanted to get into the he wanted the good, to place. The good place, right? So that is why we put so much value on money and people with money, and we think we're good because we have it. Yeah, and you know, in spirituality, they say you don't judge anybody. You know, whoever has more than you, you wish them more because mm. wishing more on people and it just you know, it, whatever you wish on others, you bring on to yourself. Right. And I really, really remind myself every time I get down this rabbit hole of, you know, all of these people doing things that's, that's really only screwing me and all, all my fellow yeah. humans, it's hard to wish them more. Right, it, it is. It is really hard to wish when them more. When they're doing more. it uh, in a way that hurts other people. Yeah. Right, they're and hurting other us, people. Yeah. They're hurting other people in the process and... Like honestly, if we didn't have money to to worry about, how happy would we be? Well, and how much would we just evaluate, um, you know, the, the the goodness and I guess the our relationships with mm -hmm. people in general? Um, how much would we base that on just who they are right. instead of uh, and our energetic connections with people instead of? Oh, I wonder what uh, old mate's got. I wonder has he got a big house? Is he successful? Has he got a good job? Or has she got a good job? Or you know. All of those things, uh, maybe we just evaluate people on, you know, yeah. also who they are. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And as you said, energetically, because what's usually the first question you ask people? So what do you do for a living? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah. there's a lot of people who think that like instinctively, like we're not doing this because we, we know we're doing it, but instinctively we're trying to see where we stand with them on yes. the economic scale, which means where we're seeing them on, the, where are we in the pecking order compared mm. to them? Are they better than me because they have more money? Right. No, nope, well, they're yeah. not. And the other thing too is maybe we should be, you were spot on, but maybe we should be thinking about that question a little bit more, like what do you do for a living? Maybe we should say, when someone asks us that, maybe we should say, well, I go for walks, you know, I uh, meditate and that's what I do for a living to help me live. Like mm -hmm. that's what I do, not what I do for a job. Right. Not what I do to. And it's funny that actually, I just thought of that then. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that, that, that over time we've transposed living like actual living for money because you say what, yeah. what what do you do for yeah. a living because the living part is the money when, yeah. you, when you ask that question yeah what do you do to make money so if we actually transposed the word living for money yeah holy we have oh my gosh all right <laughs> i need to get here. out and go for a walk i need to meditate <laughs> we should go for a walk later we should
All right. Well, uh, I think we've come to the end of this episode. Mm -hmm. And my goodness, there's so much to talk about with the Federal Reserve and all of these banks and everything. But, uh, you know, I hope everyone's enjoyed it. And let us know if we've, uh, you know, if this uh, something that you know about or you've thought of or you've got other thoughts on this, absolutely let us know. Yeah, please. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. (laughs) Bye.